Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Charles Boyer and Myrna Loy in Appointment for Love. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. With loyal hearts, America today celebrates the birthday of George Washington. And directly following the Lux Radio Theater this evening, we remind every one of you that the President of the United States will speak to the nation. So stay tuned to this station after our curtain goes down. The small boy's heaven is a land flowing with popcorn and ice cream. The painter yearns for the perfect picture. But to the producer, Valhalla is a place where he can always have stars like Myrna Loy and Charles Boyer for his plays. And so tonight for this producer, there's a little bit of heaven on earth right in the Lux Radio Theater. And there's an extra bit of satisfaction in having brought these two stars together for the first time in any theater. The play that did the trick for us is Universal's rollicking comedy success, Appointment for Love, with Charles Boyer in the same part he, part he played in the picture, a popular and successful playwright. And Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's delightful Myrna Loy, believe it or not, as a doctor. You can see the value to a patient's morale when a doctor, like Myrna Loy, takes his pulse. But it's distinctly disturbing to the playwright's morale when the doctor becomes his wife. Somehow, he doesn't understand the scientific approach to love. Our players have an appointment with love. From Carolina to California, our audience has an appointment with a gay and delightful play which we hope will brighten the winter skies for many people. Like the woman who wrote us this letter a few days ago. She says... My husband has just come home with our season ticket to the Lux Radio Theater, a whole case of Lux Flakes. We live on a ranch in Wyoming, 40 miles from town, so it's a little inconvenient to run down to the corner when the box is empty. I'm sure you don't realize how much the Lux Radio Theater means to us out here. Except for two or three movies a year, it's our only contact with the theater we love so much. So out here in our front row seats, we all say good luck to Lux Flakes. We know she'll have good luck with Lux. So here's the first act of Appointment for Love, starring Myrna Loy as Jane Alexander and Charles Boyer as Andre de Castillo. <laughs> the curtain has fallen in the Hyperion Theater. The exit march is playing, but the audience will not leave. On their feet, crowded in the aisles, New York's first-nighters are clamoring for the author, Andre Cassille. One of the first-nighters is not taking part in the demonstration. That young lady there in the second row. Through all the noise and confusion, she remains strangely calm. As a matter of fact, she's asleep. She's still dozing peacefully, but Mr. Cassio makes his entrance on the stage and holds up his hand for silence. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you don't expect me to say anything or do anything very clever. You see, an author's position in, uh, in, uh, in playmaking, Hastings. Look at this girl. See if there is a doctor in the house. In the second row, she's fainted. Excuse me. Just let me through, please. I'll take care of her. The young lady with you, madam? No, she isn't. She seems to be all alone. No, 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 please. She needs air. Stand back, please. Is there a doctor in the house? Oh, uh, did somebody call a doctor? We'll have a doctor here in a minute. Don't worry, young lady. You're going to be all right. Oh, but you see... It is your purse. I'll take it. Now, just relax. Wait, what are you doing? I'm going to carry you. Up you go now. You'll feel better outside. Oh, thank you. Maybe I will. Hey, boy. Have you found a doctor yet? Yes, sir. The box office says there's a Dr. Alexander in seat 108. All right, get him. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Alexander. Dr. Alexander. Wait, please. I'm Dr. Alexander. You, you who? I'm Dr. Alexander. So you can put me down, please. Oh, don't be silly. You're ill. You fainted. Now, don't you be silly. 
I'm not ill, and I never fainted in my life. But I saw you faint. No, you saw me sleeping. Eh? Sleeping? I couldn't keep my eyes open, and I couldn't get out. And when you picked me up, I didn't want to make a scene. Oh, so you... you fell asleep at my play. I'm afraid I did. Do you mind? Well, no good, eh? Terrible. Now, will you put me down? Gladly. Good night. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for liking my play so much, but uh, I must confess that the young lady who fainted did not faint. She was asleep. <laughs> And I adored your play tonight. Oh, thank you, Ethel. <laughs> Andre. Oh, don't you remember me? My name is Edith. Oh, yes, of course. Well, thank you, Edith. <laughs> Mr. Cassil, you wanted on the phone, sir. Miss Benson calling from Chicago. Oh, Nancy, let me have it. Hello, Nancy. Andre. Yes, Nancy, of course I missed you. Oh, it went all right. Yes, they liked it, some of them. What? Well, of course I'm glad you called. Oh. Your show is closing? Oh, that's too bad. Oh, you're glad? Well... Huh? Oh, oh, sure. Yes, of course you're going to be in my next play. Uh, here, darling, I'll let you talk to Hastings. George. Take this. Sure. Nancy Benson. Oh. Hello, Nancy. How are you? What? The next play? Oh, wait a minute. Did you promise her a part in the next one? No, no. Hello, Nancy. Why, well, we'd love to have you. Andre's tried to sell me the idea of you doing a part a dozen times. We'll talk about it. Goodbye, love. You still stuck on that girl dream boat? Uh-uh. No more. Finny. Finny? Well, she wouldn't be bad. She wouldn't be good either. Anyway, I've got another idea. A pretty one? Beautiful. There's a young lady to see you, Mr. Cassie. Oh, excuse me, George. Good evening. Oh, hello. Hello. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your party. Well, I thought you would be in bed by now, sound asleep. I will be, as soon as you give me my keys. Pardon? My keys. You picked up my purse. Oh. My keys are in it. <laughs> Hello, Cassie. Beautiful play. Beautiful. I wrote a wonderful review. Great praises. I hate to disagree with such a fine critic, but you've been taken in again, old man. Well, the best play you've ever written, Andre. Perhaps. Still not very good. Now, poke your fingers into any of my characters. What would you find, Doctor? I'm sure I don't know. Well, I'll tell you. Sawdust. Just... Sawdust. I'm afraid that's true. Now my key. Now, you also agree that my situations are phony and unbelievable. I agree absolutely. And now... No, no, no. You're not agreeing just to be polite. No, I'm not. I'm agreeing because I agree completely. The people in your play were unreasonable. Everything they did was illogical. Now, wait. They were in love. And love is unreasonable and illogical. I'm sorry, but love is very logical. So logical you can prove it in a laboratory. Oh. It's a chemical attraction based on a law governing affinity. Put two objects with affinity in a test tube, and they merge through attraction. It's the simplest of all formulas. Well, that's very scientific, I'm sure, but... <laughs> you know it's true. All you do is just add a little rose-colored romance and cloud up what's really happening. Now, if you don't mind, I'll take my keys and go home. Oh, no, no, please. I want to talk to you. You see, you are the only person here who knows the truth about my place. Except myself, of course. Oh, Mr. Castile, you're the worst kind of faker. You like your plays. You think they're wonderful. <laughs> My purse, please. Good night. Well. Hey, Dreamboat, wasn't that the babe that fainted in the theater? Uh, she's no babe. She's a doctor. And you know what the doctor thinks, Georgie? She thinks love is something you make in a test tube. <laughs> Dr. Alexander's office. No, Dr. Gunther, she isn't here just now. Well, I know she's somewhere around the hospital. Yes, sir, I'll tell her. Morning, Nora. Oh, Dr. Alexander, Dr. Gunther just called. He wants to see you about that strep case. I've already taken care of it. Nora, tell Dr. Wade I'd like to see him after his wrong. Yes, doctor. Oh, there's a patient in your office. Thanks. Hello, doctor. Well. Well, here I am. I came to see you do it. Do what? Make love with a test tube, you know. You said you put in two people Mr. And... Castile, I'm very busy, and we're not allowed to have social calls at the hospital. Oh, this is not a social call, Dr. Alexander. I didn't sleep a wink last night, thinking about what you told me. Dr. Alexander, Dr. Gunther's here. Oh. May I come in, Doctor? Certainly, Dr. Gunther. Uh, this is Dr. Gunther, our chief of staff, Mr. Andre Castile. How do you do? 
How are you, Mr. Cassiel? Never felt better in my life. Uh, that is, uh, until, uh, until last night. Uh, yes, last night, oh, I just went to pieces. Well, what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Cassiel? Uh, I believe it's my heart, Doctor. Yes, I find it very difficult to sleep. I see. You don't mind if I watch your examination of the patient, Dr. Alexander? Why, no, not at all. But I think probably Mr. Cassiel would rather come back when he has more time. Oh, no. Might just as well get it over with while I'm here. Don't you think so, Doctor? Of course. Let me feel your pulse, please. Dr. Alexander is my assistant. I like to watch these young ones, see their methods. They sometimes can teach us old fellows a thing or two. Oh, I don't doubt that about Dr. Alexander at all. Uh, nurse, will you take Mr. Cassiel's coat? Yeah. You say you're having a little trouble with your heart, eh? Yes, Doctor. I think probably it's occupational disease. He probably overworks it. Yes, I know. I've seen many of your plays, Mr. Cassiel. Very interesting. Oh, thank you, sir. Will you take off your tie, please? Hmm? Tie? Yes, tie. I don't think he reports any interesting symptoms. It could be pure imagination. Yes, cardiac hysteria is rather a common thing. Will you open your shirt, please? Shirt? What for? I want to listen to your heart. Oh, well, I'm sure I'm going to feel much better, Doctor. No I... talking, please. Oh, sorry. Stethoscope, nurse. Yes, Doctor. Quiet now. Suddenly. <laughs> it's cold. Please. No talking. Hmm. Very unusual. Really? What does it sound like? Well, I'd say offhand... Uh... Really? Afraid so. Did you hear anything good? Do you drink very much, Mr. Cassiel? No, no, a little wine, sometimes a little brandy, a little whiskey, you know. Dr. Alexander may have to stop all that. Dr. Alexander certainly will. Uh, how much sleep do you average, Mr. Cassiel? Oh, not very much at night, but quite a bit in the morning. Early evening hours are the best, aren't they, Dr. Gunther? They certainly are. Have you ever been on a diet, Mr. Cassiel? No, I always say it's not what you eat, but with whom you eat. Isn't that so, Doctor? Well, philosophers say the best part of a good dinner is a good companion. Now, Mr. Cassiel, will you jump up and down on one foot, please? On the, certainly. That's fine. I really think it's a matter of fatigue, Dr. Gunther. Too much work? Too much play. All right. You can stop that now. I want to listen again. Oh, good. This part I like very much. No talking, please. Sorry. Hmm. Yes, Mr. Cassiel? I would suggest that for the time being, you give up liquor. Not play so hard and get more sleep. Later on, if it seems necessary, we'll have a thorough examination. Why not do it now, Doctor? Well, of course, we believe in a complete diagnosis. If the patient is ready, Doctor, I'm sure it would be better to do it all at once. Thank you, Dr. Gunther. You don't know how helpful you've been. Will you step this way, please? Of course. And I'll look at all of your reports, Mr. Cassiel. Thank you. I'll drop by later, Dr. Alexander. Very well, Doctor. I guess you're stuck with him, Doctor. We'll see who gets stuck. Give him the work. Everything? Everything. We'll start off by taking some blood from his arm to the lab. Yes, Doctor. Hand me a needle, please. I'm waiting, Dr. Alexander. I'm coming. Needle, Doctor. Thanks. All right. Now, Mr. Cassiel, your arm, please. Just hold it still. Oh, look, before we start, uh, what about dinner tonight? Steady, Mr. Cassiel. Uh, what about... Ouch! <laughs> Hello, office? Uh, this is Dr. Alexander calling. I have a patient who's been coming to my office every day for two weeks. His name is Cassiel. Oh, you know him. Well, he's not to be allowed to come to my office again. He's cured. Yes. And if he insists, will you please have him shown to psychiatry? Thank you. I know you don't like it, but you're having a good time. I like to dance. Oh, is that all? I used to dance a lot. Really? That sounds very frivolous, but it proves I was right. It doesn't prove a thing. No? No, decidedly no. Sure? Look, we've been out now five or six times. We've dined, we've danced. Still, there are no rosy-colored clouds. Oh, it's too soon. Oh, speaking of clouds, I have a place in the country I'd like you to see. It's an old hunting lodge, way back in the forest. Is that where you write your plays? Well, uh, not exactly. It's too nice for work. The house seems to come right out of the trees. Oh, it's very quiet and peaceful. Sounds like an ideal place to write your play. <laughs> there is a waterfall. You can hear it from the house at night. Sounds wonderful. Will you, will you come to see it sometime? Oh, I'm very busy. Doctors never get vacations. Well, Dr. Alexander. Yes? Call for you, doctor. They want you at the hospital right away. Emergency. Oh. Oh, Andre, I'm terribly sorry. I always get emergencies when I'm having the most fun. Well, I'll go with you. Oh, certainly not. It might be ours. 
Goodbye, Andre. I don't know what we'd have done without you, Doctor. I think they'll be all right now. If you want me again tonight... Don't worry, we won't. And you've got to get some rest. You look all in. Don't you think someone ought to drive you home? No. I'll be all right. I'm just a little jumpy, that's all. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Andre. Hello. How did you know I wanted to see you waiting out here? Well, you said you would work very late. I was afraid you'd be tired. I am tired, but I'm happy. They said she couldn't live. She did. They both lived. I never saw you look this way before. I never felt like this before. Dr. Gunther was there. He sent me home. He told me not to come back for two weeks. I was going to call you and tell you. And you were waiting right here. I'll always be waiting. Always. Oh, Aunt. You know, I'm kind of surprised at myself. You don't mind my saying that, do you? This is something I thought I'd never do. Never. Well, I'm very happy that you changed your mind. Darling, I'm, I'm not being silly about it, am I? Oh, you're being very sweet. We'll be all alone at my hunting lodge. Nobody will even know we're there, will they? Nobody but the people who take care of the place. You don't have to worry about them. I still can't believe it. <laughs> Mrs. Andre Cassie. Oh, Andre, it sounds beautiful. There's the wire, Martha, arriving tonight, see? You think I'd better make up two rooms? No, Martha. He says he's bringing his bride up here. That means till death do them part. Well, I hope it's true. It's about time Mr. Castile settled down. Well, I don't know. We had a lot of fun. Remember the time three girls showed up at once? We certainly played hide-and-seek that weekend. You ought to think shame to yourself, you men. <laughs> we had to do a lot of fancy conniving. The only way we could get him out of the house was to say he had to go to a fire. He wore my helmet and carried my axe. He certainly looked silly, too. Yeah, he did that. I wonder which one of them he married. Well, you know, I think I'd fancy the Benson girl. Yes, the Benson girl, that's the one. Uh, that is, if it was me that was doing it. There they are. Hello, Jim. Uh, hello, Mr. Cassie. Welcome home, Mr. Cassie. Hello, Martha. Congratulations to you, sir. And to you, too, ma'am. Thank you, Timothy. She's wonderful, but a little bit heavy. <laughs> Put me down, darling. Uh, Hello, Martha. Hello, Timothy. Welcome, Mrs. Cassiel. Well, this is a surprise, quite a surprise, I must say. Mr. Cassiel, you certainly did very well for yourself. Thank you, Timothy. Now, how about some wine? It's all ready, sir. You'll have it in two minutes. I'll fix some supper, Mr. Cassiel. What a nice house, Andre. What a nice wife to live in it. My wife. Sounds kind of new, but I suppose I'll get used to it. <laughs> My wife. My husband sounds new, too. Nice and new and warm. Hello? Come on. I want to show you our waterfall. Who? There. You can see it just from the window. Uh, just a minute. Oh, it's lovely, Andre. Oh, Mr. Cassio. Who is it, Timothy? Well, it's for you, sir. A certain party. Well, just tell him I'm not to be disturbed. I can't tell him that. And he's going to disturb you quite a lot. It's uh, uh, the old chief. What chief? Which chief do you mean? The old chief. Fire Chief Benson. Fire Chief? What in the world would... Oh, 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 Fire Chief Benson. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Fire Chief Benson. And he's very excited, and he seems to be heading up this way. Oh. What's he coming up here for? Oh, oh he might uh, just drop in. You know, he, he does from time to time. Yes, we, we talk about fires. Everybody belongs to the volunteer fire department in the country. i better speak to him. You know, this sounds like fun. Yeah, sometimes it is, ma'am, and sometimes it isn't. Is there a fire now? Uh, there's smoke, ma'am. Oh, yes, quite a lot of smoke. Hello. How are you, Chief? Hello, Pappy. What's going on up there? I just got in from New York tonight, Pappy. Come on down to the station and get me. Oh, no, no. No, I'd love to, Chief. But, uh, <laughs> you see, I, I'm on my honeymoon. What? Whose honeymoon? Mine. Oh, it's nobody you know, Chief. Will you stop calling me Chief? I'll be right up there, Pappy. No, 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 wait. Chief, if that's the way you feel, I'll suddenly do my duty. I'll be right down to the station. You can count on me. I thought so, and I'll be waiting. Make it snappy, Pappy. Goodbye, Chief. <laughs> well, I'll have to go. Is there a fire in the depot, sir? Oh, very bad one. I'm sorry, Jane. Community duty, you know. I'll be back soon. 
Come on, darling, I'll go with you. Oh, no, 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 no. They don't let women go. They wouldn't like it with that, Timothy. Oh, no. The chief had just raised the roof, ma'am, if you showed up. All right, but be careful. I will. Uh, Timothy, my axe and my fire hat. Uh, coming up, sir. Now, don't take any foolish chances, Andre. Yes, and don't get burned. I won't. I promise. Bye. <laughs> Will you get me the depot, please? Thank you. Hello, depot? How's the fire going? The fire? Well, of course there's a fire. There isn't. Well, is Mr. Cassil there? He is. Talking to a what? A, a young lady? Well, thank you. Good night. Jean? Here, dear. Hello, darling. Sorry I was so long. Tell me all about it. Was it bad? Oh, very stubborn, please. Very hard to get under control, but it's all out now. Nothing left but the ashes. Uh, nothing. I could see the flames from the upstairs window. Huh? Oh, you, you could... <coughs> you could see the... <coughs> you want some wine? Your throat must be very dry. Yes, it is very... <coughs> Sit down, dear. I'll get it. You're probably exhausted. Oh, no, I feel fine now. Your face is so hot. Mm. I hope you didn't get too near the flames. Oh, no, no. I, I was very careful about that. Mm. Your pulse is pretty fast. Oh, well, it is the effect you have on me, darling. Might be the suspense, too. The suspense? Yes. You weren't quite sure I would believe your fire chief story. Oh. Oh, you, I didn't fool you, eh? Not for long. Oh, darling, you didn't have to go to so much trouble. You could have told me the truth. Were you afraid I'd be jealous? Well, it was sort of the idea. But I'm never jealous. Most women are. Oh, that's because they don't understand it. You know, jealousy is a very simple thing. Physiologically, it's merely the adrenal gland pumping adrenaline to the bloodstream. Of course, it has a physiological trigger. Huh. Bing? Mm -hmm. Like that, sets the gland working. Oh, but it's a hangover from caveman days and has no place in a civilized mind. Do you really believe all that? I certainly believe it. Listen, if you ever catch me being jealous, I give you leave to put on your tiger skin, pick up your club, and beat me back to my senses. Well, that might be fun. Yes, but I'll never give you the chance to find out. No, I might be a bad wife to you in a lot of ways, but I promise I'll never go primitive on you. I like bad wives. Darling, aren't you tired? Not a bit. Want to go for a walk? But I certainly do not want to go for a walk. No, neither do I. <laughs> now, who can that be? Another fire, darling? Hello? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Who? No, we ain't got any Dr. Alexander here. We never oh, heard... uh, Timothy, that's for me. Excuse me, dear. Uh, just a minute. Thank you, Timothy. Hello? Yes, Dr. Gunther? Oh, really? Oh, yes, of course I can. Wait just one minute. Andre, is there a train back to town tonight? Hmm? No, that's... what's wrong? I have to get back to the hospital. What? Hello, Dr. Gunther. We'll have to drive in. I'll make it as soon as I can. Oh, no, certainly not. It's perfectly all right. Good night. Dr. Edward has been hurt, and I have to go back and take over his cases. Tonight? Yes. And I have to get dressed. But, darling, this is our honeymoon. I know. I'm terribly sorry, Andre. Oh, I won't let you go. Andre, don't be silly. There are 20 patients waiting for me there. Well, uh, I'm waiting here. But you're not sick, darling. Well, I am, so. Uh, look at my tongue. See? Now I feel my head. I've got a fever. I'm coming down with something. Andre, you do look sort of funny. Ah, huh, there, you see? Timothy, put Mr. Cassiel to bed. Uh, yes, ma'am. No, 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 wait, no. Put him to bed right away, Timothy, and put an ice bag at his feet. What? If he gets a chill, good. Good night, dear. Jane. Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of Appointment for Love, starring Charles Boyer and Myrna Loy in just a moment. But right now, I have a date. With a girl, Mr. Ruiz? Oh, no, Sally. With three girls. They're Lux girls, too. Of course, uh, I'll have to admit I have a little trouble understanding what they say about Lux. Anyway, they're keen about it. Here's their picture. Why, they're babies. Very special babies. Mary, Anne, and Judy Lucas of East Hartford, Connecticut. They're triplets, and already at only 16 months, they're real Lux girls. Mrs. Stanley Lucas, their pretty young mother, uses new quick Lux for everything they wear. 
Will you read what she says, Sally? Mm-hmm. Like all mothers, I want the best for my babies. The triplets are my first babies, too, so I'm three times as fussy. I use new Quick Lux for all their clothes. Dresses, woolies, diapers, everything. It's so gentle, doesn't mat or shrink woolen. Diapers stay soft and don't chase the baby's tender skin. And Lux keeps their things new-looking longer, too. Yes, Lux flakes are very gentle. The safest kind of care for baby things. There's nothing in them to irritate even the triplet's sensitive skin. Or to roughen and redden a mother's hands, either. That's important when you've even one baby's washing to do. New Quick Lux helps a busy mother in lots of important ways. It's so gentle. Saves pretty washables for grown-ups as well as babies. Saves hands. Saves time because it suds so quickly. Saves pennies, too. A little goes so far, it's very thrifty. Get the generous big box of New Quick Lux first thing tomorrow. And let it help you save in all these ways. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Appointment for Love, starring Myrna Loy as Jane and Charles Boyer as Andre. So far, the marriage of the successful playwright and the successful lady doctor has been a dismal failure. The first two days of Jane's honeymoon have been spent at the hospital, working day and night. Now Andre has returned to his apartment in New York, only to find that his bride has taken a separate apartment in the same building. Now, look, this is ridiculous. What's wrong with this place? Nothing. It's large. I like it. It's where I live. If you don't like it, uh, I'll get another one. But, darling, that's not the idea. You've got to be reasonable. But I want to be reasonable. But there is no reason in the world for me to live on the 17th floor and my wife to live on the 22nd. There are many reasons. I don't want to hear any of them. All right, if you don't want to listen to me, I'll just go upstairs. Who ever heard of a bird building two nests? In this case, it happens to be very necessary. I don't see any necessity at all. We can talk it over when you're a little calmer. Ring for the elevator, calm. please. I want to talk it over right now. Darling, I don't want to upset you. I'm not upset. I just don't understand this kind of a joke. It's not a joke. Going up. 22, please. Now, listen, Jane. Andre, please don't be difficult about something that's very sensible and very sound. Sensible? When we were married, you knew that I was a doctor and that I was going to go on with my work. Yes, but I didn't know I would have to make an appointment every time I wanted to see you. Please. Let me finish. All right, go ahead. Now, I have to be at the hospital at all hours. Sometimes I come in so tired I don't want to see anybody. Sometimes I get called at 4 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I work all night and sleep all day. Now, really, you couldn't possibly fit your life into that crazy kind of routine. I only know one thing. 22, madam. Thank you. I only know that when a man marries a woman, it is because he wants to be married to her. But you will be married to me, and I'll be married to you. The only difference is that I'll be free to do my work, and you'll be free to do your work. Now, really, that's a very sensible plan. No. Why? Why isn't it sensible? Because, it, because, it, because it's like that, uh, that test tube idea of yours. It figures out everything but human relationships. Andre, look, the most important thing is for our marriage to last. You think so? Yes. Well, I think the most important thing is for our marriage to begin. And it will not begin until you come home. And home is where the husband lives. That's the law. The law. Really, that's very funny. Oh, I don't think so. I refuse to argue about it in the hall. Do you want to come inside? No, I don't. Very well. Good night, Andre. All right, good night. Going down? Yes, 17. 17? You want to wait for the lady? No, 17. <laughs> Mr. Cassil. Mr. Cassil, sir. <sighs> hmm? What is it? I hate to disturb your rest, sir, but it's Mrs. Cassie. She's come to have breakfast with you. Mm. What? Your wife, sir. She's here for breakfast. Mm. Mm. Breakfast? Mm. What time is it? It's almost a quarter of seven, sir. Uh, almost a quarter of seven. In the morning? Get out of here before I kill you. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, shall I tell madame you're not accustomed to having breakfast before twelve? Sir? Oh, tell her to... Never mind. I'll tell her myself. Uh, get me a rope. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. 
I woke the cook up, sir, and breakfast will be ready in a few minutes. Stop talking about breakfast. Quarter of seven. Where is my wife? In the dining room, sir. Keepers, keepers, quarter of seven. Never heard of it. Good morning. Uh, good morning, darling. Sit down, dear. I hope I'm not too early. Oh, no, no. I always get up in the middle of the night to have breakfast. <laughs> oh, it's going to be fun. We can have breakfast together every morning. Every morning? I promise. At the same time? Mm-hmm. You see, this gives me plenty of time to get down to the hospital at 7.30. Mornings you're dressed, you can walk down with me. Oh, it isn't far. It's only a mile. Oh. Oh, that would be interesting, too. Yes. We could walk around all by ourselves at half past seven in the morning. <laughs> Gosh, I shall look forward to that. Andre, have you thought about last night? Yeah, a little. I'm sorry we quarreled. So am I. Oh, here's the key to my apartment. I already have the one to yours. <laughs> Marvelous. You have everything figured out. I'll tell you all about it at dinner tonight. Uh, dinner. Mm, dinner seems so far away. Will the dam have uh, oatmeal? Mm, yes, and lots of cream. Will you have oatmeal, sir? What? Oh, no, I, 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 I thought not, sir. <laughs> you see, this is the only meal I can really be sure of. Usually I don't have time for lunch. By the time I get home for dinner, I'm too tired for it. Yes. What are your plans for the day? Hmm? The day? Oh, you mean today, now. Sausage and eggs, sir. It's coffee. Strong coffee. Yes, sir. I thought maybe if I could get time off for lunch, I could meet you at that little restaurant where we had our first date. Oh, darling, that's a very romantic idea. I feel romantic today. This is our first breakfast together. Mm-hmm. All right. Then I'll pick you up the theater and we'll have lunch. After that, I'll have an ulcer operation at three. <coughs> <laughs> Come on, George. Wake uh, up. Get up. Uh, what's the matter? What's the matter? Come on, wake up. I want to talk to you. Oh, I'm dreaming. No, no, no. You're not dreaming. I had to talk to someone, and nobody I know is up yet. What time is it? <laughs> Eight o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock. Hey, I thought you were on a honeymoon. That's what I thought. George, I married a monster. What? I married a monster. This better be good. It's very bad. My wife eats breakfast at seven in the morning, then walks to work one mile. And if I'm dressed... She's going to let me walk with her. <laughs> what can I do? Shoot her. I love her. Then shoot yourself. Oh, now, George. <laughs> Please, be serious. At 8 o'clock in the morning? Not only that. She has her own apartment. Five floors up. Say that again, slowly. She lives on the 22nd floor. I live on the 17th floor. And she won't come down. She won't? No, and I won't go up. What do you want me to do? You don't think you don't need a producer? You need a lawyer. No, it's just some silly idea she has about marriage. You know, two people have to be two people. She has her work. Can't she and... work and be married, too? Yes, but she wants her own apartment. Oh, I get it. You live your life and I live mine. Well, go ahead and live your life. She'll get so jealous, she'll <laughs> turn into a human fly and crawl down the outside of the building. She doesn't believe in jealousy. She's got to believe in something. Look here. Act one, wife won't play house. Act two, husband makes wife jealous. Act three, they wind up in each other's arms, curtain falls. Dreamboat, it's a cinch. It's sure fire. Thanks. Go back to sleep, George. Thank you. Do you know, darling, that we are celebrating our 48th wedding anniversary? Our what? 48 hours. Oh, and we've done nothing but quarrel. Nothing. Coffee, sir. Please. Jane, darling... I've been thinking a lot about us since breakfast. So have I. Tonight we'll have dinner together in my apartment. We'll have dinner there every night. That was part of the plan. We'll have breakfast there, too. Of course we will. I want to be with you as much as I possibly can. Hey, darling. Is it fair to you? Why, Michael. Michael Daly. How nice. Well, yeah, this is a rare piece of good fortune. I don't believe it. I just got off the plane about half an hour ago. Oh, no. I called the hospital three times, wandered in here to try to drown my despair. Here you are at my very feet. Oh, really, Mike? Oh, I was going to write you a million times, but you know I never write letters. Anyway, you never answer them. No. Gina, we... now, pardon me, old fellow. You don't mind if I sit down? No, no, sure. Thanks. 
Alex, I thought of a dozen ways to lure you to Brazil, but I knew you wouldn't come. Michael, listen. What have you been doing? You look peaked. Mike, will you please stop? I'm trying to introduce Mr. Cassidy. How do you do? Now you okay. mustn't be busy tonight, Alex. You have to run me all over New York. Michael. Yes, I want to do all the old places we used to do. Michael, Mr. Cassiel is my husband. Oh, that's very nice, yes. Ha, ha. Uh, what, did you say husband? Yes, he did say husband. Yes, Michael, we're married. Oh, well, I don't like that. I don't like it at all. I walk around the corner, go to Brazil. The moment my back's turned, you marry the first beggar who comes along. Pardon me, old fellow. Sure, sure, I know. <laughs> Michael. Mr. Cassiel is the Mr. Cassiel, the very famous one who writes the plays. Oh, well, don't tell me you married him for that reason. I'm famous, too. She never married me. That she was never going to get married, and I was gentleman enough to believe her. But if she was going to get married, I certainly think she should have married me. I saw you first. You know, you don't mind all that. No, no, certainly not. I think you made a great mistake in getting married at all, Jane. Brilliant career in medicine, your own life. You might have turned out to be a great doctor. But I'm still practicing. Oh, he can't even support you. Eh? No, wait, <laughs> Michael. Michael. But look, you see... I don't see what you want to live in New York for anyway. You'd be much better off as a doctor on one of my expeditions. Much more excitement than this. Really have a chance to try new things. Catch new microbes. Go into jungles. Sail the seven seas. Fight epidemics with one hand, natives with the other. You pass all that up for marriage here in New York, living in a little cooped up apartment. Two apartments. Hmm? All right, two apartments, six apartments. What difference does it make? Why two apartments? It's a long story, and we don't want to go into it now. You know, Andre, Michael's an explorer. Mm -hmm. He goes to all kinds of weird places, yeah. meets all kinds of weird people. Don't have to go very far, meet them everywhere. Yes. No offense. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Two apartments. Well, well. Michael used to be a patient of mine, didn't you, Michael? Ah, oh, you bet I was. That's why I'm back here. Devil of a lot of fun having Cheney for a doctor, old fellow. Oh, you're a patient of us too, huh? Ah, I'll never forget those treatments. Used to put me to sleep like the dead. Why don't you try one now? <laughs> Michael, it's been lovely seeing you. And we must get together if you're going to be in town for long. But in the meantime, I really have to run. I have to get back to the hospital. Always running off to the hospital. You ought to break her of that habit, Mr. Cassiel. Why don't you take her out of the hospital? Now, look. Because it... I don't want to be taken out of the hospital. Oh, all right. I'll drive you over there. I want to talk to you about doing a broadcast. Scientific. You don't mind, old fellow. You really want to know what I think? Uh, look, I'm... Michael. I'll talk to you about that later. Goodbye for now. Right, oh. Oh, by the way, while I'm still in the States, I'm going to call you every day. Ah, oh, yes, I am. I'm going to be an absolute pest. You're making a very good start. <laughs> oh, much better than this. Goodbye. 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 If you had said, old fellow, one more time, I think I would have killed him with my bare hands. Good thing he didn't try it. He has muscles like an ox. No. Oh, he has muscles like an ox. He's really very nice, Andre. Well, it's a matter of whether or not you like oxes. Oxen. Oxen, all right. Oxen. Terrible word. Seems to do very well here, though. He's quite fascinating. You know he's been all over. Why doesn't he go back to all over? <laughs> oh, you'll change your mind when you get to know him better. I don't want to know him better. Andre, don't shout. Don't shout him. He's just a patient of mine with a very interesting fever. <laughs> very interesting. Taking care of him is only part of my job. Wait a uh, Check these, yes. After all, it's just the same as you're going off to meet that Benson girl. That didn't mean anything to you, did it? Of course not. So, you see, this doesn't mean much either. Goodbye, darling. What time is it, Lily? It's just 9.20, sir. Uh, what time did Mrs. Cassil say she'd be here? Around about 9.30, sir, if she can get away from the hospital. 9.30? Good. Some of the 1926 vintage tonight, sir? No, no, not wine. Cognac. Yes, sir. You'll pardon my noting it, sir, but don't you think wine would be safer in case Madame hasn't dined tonight? Yes, possibly, but this is not for Mrs. Cassil. It is for a lady who has dined. Are you expecting someone else, sir? Yes, uh, Miss uh, Meredith. Tonight, sir? Uh-huh, in a few minutes. But uh, aren't there possibilities of uh, complications, sir? Do you think so? Well, uh, very likely, sir. Uh, do you suppose Mrs. Cassil might be jealous, lady? I, uh... I don't know, sir. Uh, well, let's hope so. We can try. I'll answer that, Larry. You get the cognac. Yes, sir. Hello, Edith. Hello. 
I hope I'm not late. I had such an awful time getting away. <laughs> I'm so glad to see you again. Oh, I couldn't believe my ears when you telephoned. Yes. Let me take you around. Oh, I'd given you up for lost when I heard you got married. I said, there goes another good man out of circulation. And you know, Andre, there's only a few of them left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sit down, Edith. Oh, nice. Nice and cozy. <laughs> I wanted to see you again. Yes, because I felt I hadn't been very nice the last time you were here. Oh? Oh, the night the play opened. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You know, Andre, I've seen your play dozens of times, and I just love it. Oh, <laughs> oh, you certainly must have had an awful lot of experience to write a play like that. <laughs> Sit down, Andre. Over here. Oh, thank you. Cognac, sir. Uh, thanks. Just leave it, please. Yes, sir. Mmm, nice. Well, uh, would, you, would you like to hear some music? Oh, sure. Put it on. I'll turn off the light. Huh? <laughs> there, I can hear better in the dark. Oh, I see. Oh, you have a wonderful view from here. I have a wonderful view from my face, too. It's on 6060. Yes? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can see the Hudson River. If you ever get tired of looking at the East River, you can come over to my place and look out my window and see the Hudson River. <laughs> well, that might be a very nice change. <laughs> it would be. <laughs> Say, you're not expecting anybody, are you? Ex hmm? No? Why? Well, you keep looking at the door as if you're afraid somebody might come in. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? Oh, well, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look at a fire, it just makes me feel nice. Drowsy. Yeah, really. <laughs> I just like to cuddle up. Mm. <laughs> uh, would you like a cigarette? A cigarette? Oh, no. No, I don't smoke much. I don't drink much either. Just once in a while with someone I like very, very much. <laughs> and then, of course, I only take one. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Oh, nothing. It sounded like the door. No, no, don't get up. Sit close to me. You know, darling, it's very sweet of you to come here. And you know, you know you shouldn't. Well, why not? <laughs> you said you wanted me to come over, so I said to myself, well, I'll come over. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, this fire looks cozy. It's cold outside. Uh, it is. Uh, this is my wife. How do you do? Uh, darling, uh, this is Miss Meredith, an old friend of mine. Yes. I thought you were going to be at the hospital tonight, Jane. Oh, no. I just had to give Michael a few shots and then watch the progress of the fever. I didn't see much sense in hanging around the hospital for that. Well, I guess I'd better be going. I really have to be going. You see, I'm late for an ap appointment. Oh, no, please don't go. I just dropped in to say hello. I'm going up to change now. I wish I could stay, but well, you know how it is. Good night, Miss Meredith. Good night. Listen, I want to get out of here. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I'd been around, but this beats me. You didn't marry her on a bet or anything, did you? Larry, get Miss Meredith's wrap, please. I'm sorry, I'll have to go up and explain. Go up? Where? Yes, the, the, just up. Goodbye. Well, while you're thinking up an explanation for her, will you think of one for me, too? <laughs> Come in, dear. Oh, Jane, I want to tell you something. Don't bother, darling. I understand. You were just rehearsing a scene in your new play. Oh, no, no, we are not. Uh, you see, Miss Meredith uh, is not an actress. Oh, really? She's so lovely. She ought to be very good on the stage. Oh, you think she's attractive? Oh, yes, very. <laughs> well, of course, uh, I haven't known her very long. Uh, hello, hello. How about a little three-handed game of gin rummy? What? <laughs> what is he doing here? I'm keeping Michael here under observation, waiting for his fever to break. Getting better, too. Oh, I feel fine. This man is sick. Why isn't he at the hospital? Not until the serum works. He has to stay up and do all the things he does normally. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to judge how effective the treatment is. I don't like being here. Why not? He's a friend of mine. Look, I don't object to your having your friends like Miss Meredith, do I? Yes, I know you don't. That's the trouble with you. Brief intermission, Mr. DeMille will bring Myrna Loy and Charles Foyer back to the microphone for Act Three of Appointment for Love. Meanwhile, let's have a little music. Time was runs in my stockings. 
were just a bore. But oh my, that's not true anymore. All that was yesterday. Time was, I was extravagant, I can see. I'm wiser now than I used to be. That foolish yesterday. Nowadays, wise girls are saving their stockings, cutting down costly runs with nightly new Quick Lux Care. When you give stockings their nightly luxing, whether they're silk or nylon, rayon or cotton, you're guarding them, saving them two ways. First, you're taking away the soil and perspiration that can injure the fibers. And at the same time, you're guarding their vital elasticity, the quality that lets them stretch and spring back when they're strained without breaking easily into runs. Harsh soaps, Cake soap rubbing robs stockings of elasticity. Then they don't last as they should. Gentle new quick lux keeps stockings new looking longer. Helps you get better wear from every pair. Nylon or cotton, whatever you use, got on lux every night. Lux makes a thrifty. Keep stockings nifty, it's easy to care for them right. You'll find luxing your stockings will really pay. Stick to those gentle plates every day. Stockings are precious now. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. The curtain rises on the third act of Appointment for Love, starring Charles Boyer and Myrna Loy. Castile, their differences patched up, have at last made a definite appointment to meet at home. But home has a different meaning for each of them. That evening, when Mr. Castile steps into the elevator, the boy says, 17, Mr. Castile. No, 22. And a few minutes later, when Mrs. Castile arrives, looking breathlessly happy. 22, Mrs. Castile. No, 17, please. After waiting until 2 o'clock in the morning in his bride's apartment, Mr. Andre Cassiel is good and sore. Hello. Hello. Is this the Henley Medical Center? Well, I want to speak to Dr. Alexander. What? She checked out. At what time? 10.30. I see. Thank you. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Cassiel's apartment. Oh, don't hang up, Miss Meredith. Tell me, were you expecting a call from Mr. Cassiel? Oh, you didn't know, but you hoped. Is that it? Well, don't worry, Miss Meredith. It happens to the best of us. You see, I've been stood up, too. Good night. Dr. Alexander's office. Oh, good morning, Mr. Cassiel. No, she's not here, Mr. Cassiel. She just left with Mr. Michael Daly. Mr. Castile, please. They went to do a broadcast on the radio, the scientific forum. Mr. Castile. I'm sorry, sir, but Studio B is on the air. You can't go in now, sir. Listen, is that the scientific forum in there? Uh, yes, Well, sir. get out of my way now. Please, sir. Quiet. And now we're ready for questions from the audience. The usher will pass through the aisles of the microphone. Now, are there any questions you would like to ask Dr. Alexander? I have a question, please. Yes, madam? Is it true, Dr. Alexander, that simple cases of measles still prove fatal to primitive people? Yes, it is. The primitive man lacks resistance because his system has not had to exercise the fun functional guards against the disease, which create a certain immunity. Thank you. Anybody else? Let me have that microphone, please. Thank you very much. Uh, if you will be so kind, I have a question I would like to ask Dr. Alexander. The question is this. Where did you spend last night? Andre! Shut that mic off! You were not at home. You were not at the hospital. Where were you? Blow that man over here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a husband. <laughs> Outside, sir. Please. Oh, say, Doc, come on. Come what do you say, Dr. Alexander? Can you give us a statement? Yeah, let's yeah, have a statement, Doctor. Doc, huh? Sit down, boys. Thanks. Hello, Pete. I haven't seen you since I was at Bellevue. That's right, Doc. You've still been getting famous since then. Okay. Why don't we get a few pictures, Doc? 
No, not at all. Help yourself. Come on, fellas. Oh, well, I suppose you know why we're here, Doc. I can't imagine. Well, like the rest of the nation, we want to know the answer to that burning question. Yes, right. Right. Oh, what question on. is that, Pete? Well, your husband and about a hundred million others would like to know where you spent last night. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, all right, boys, I'll tell you. I spent last night in the apartment of one of the most charming and romantic men in all New York. Oh. You wouldn't want to give us his name, would you, Doc? Gentlemen. Do you think I'm a cat? <laughs> paper, paper, pretty doctor tells all. Hey, right here, it's a mystic fight on radio. Where were you last night? Where were you last night? Where were you last night? The Cathedral. Yes, what is it? Miss Nancy Benson to see you, sir. Oh, Nancy? Ah, uh, uh, don't get up, Pappy. Just the old fire chief calling. Hello, Nancy. How are you, Pappy? Well, what's the matter? You look awful. Got a cold? Yes, yes, I have a cold. Uh huh. It's in your feet. Oh, come on, Pappy. Where's your sense of humor? This isn't serious. It's funny. Why be worried about publicity? I wish that were my face all over the front pages. Oh, I'm not worried about publicity. Now, don't tell me you're worried about her. Well, she's the kind that tells her husband about the other man. And I thought doctors were supposed to be ethical. Well, if I hadn't started it with that radio business. Oh, yes, I'll admit that wasn't very smart. But you can't sit around here moping about it the rest of your life. Leary, get Mr. Casile tap. No, Nancy, really, I... Now, look, Pappy, you write plays, you get your people into all sorts of jams and get them out very convincingly. But the first little thing that happens to you personally, you act like a schoolboy caught throwing kisses to his teacher. Oh, come on, Pappy, you're getting out of this joint right now. <laughs> Maybe you're right. You can get my hat, Larry. Yes, sir. You're a good guy, Nancy. Will you be dining at home tonight, sir? I suppose so. He's dining all right with me and about 85 other people. Oh, a party. But a good one. You think a party's a good idea? You bet I do. Now, for Pete's sake, stop playing Hamlet. Your hat, sir. Thank you, Larry. Oh, I suppose you read that she's going on some sort of an expedition to Mexico and getting a divorce on the side. Yes. Yes, I read it. Oh, I knew this thing couldn't last. You didn't have anything in common. And besides, Pappy, I never did think you were the marrying kind. <laughs> That's the trouble. I am. Huh? Going up? Oh, good evening, Doctor. Hello, Gus. Nice night. Is it? 17, Doctor? No, 22. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you swapped apartments with Mr. Casile. On account of the night when you stayed in 17A all night. You haven't told that to anyone else, I hope. Oh, no, no, ma'am. I never interfere in the private affairs of the tenants. That's a rule. It's a good rule to keep. Yes, ma'am. But you see, you stayed down there all night, and he stayed up here. Who stayed up here? Mr. Casile. He came in with a box of flowers. I said 17, and he said no, 22. You know, the next day, the janitor told me he found all those flowers out on the sidewalk. Are you sure of what you're saying? Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, but I'd better shut up before I interfere in the private affairs of the tenants. Just let me off at 17. Hello, Leary. Oh, uh, good evening, madame. Leary, where's Mr. Cassio? Hello, oh, Dr. Alexander. Who are you? It's so nice of you to come. We really didn't expect you. Andre, look who's here. Jane. Hey, there's a doctor in the house, folks. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we thought you were halfway to Mexico by now, didn't we, Pappy? Yes. Oh, it's so much more civilized to be friendly about divorces. And don't you worry about Pappy, Doctor. He's well on the road to a speedy recovery. Aren't you, Pappy? Will you kindly take your hands off my husband and stop calling him Pappy? Now, honey, don't start getting jealous. Get your hands off. Ow! And I'm not going to get a divorce. Jean, what is this? Come with me, Pappy. I've got to speak to you. Just ring to the elevator, please. I did. Now, what is all this nonsense? Going up? Get in, Andre. 22, please. Where are we going? Please. I will not. Well, at least don't shout. Come downstairs in front of my friends. Why did you come downstairs? To tell you where I spent that night? I don't care where you spent that night. Oh, don't you? No. You were where you wanted to be. And I was where I wanted to be. 22. Where? Well, waiting for the only woman I ever loved. Or ever will love. The only woman you ever loved. Oh, darling. Why, darling? Well, you see, while you were upstairs in my apartment, I was downstairs in your apartment. I don't care where you... What, what do you say? In my apartment? You mean you, mean you were it, in... Jane. All night, darling. But I was right here. I was waiting. And you were... Waiting, too. 
for the only man I ever loved or ever will love. Oh, darling. <laughs> Mr. DeMille will bring our stars back to the microphone for their curtain call in just a moment. When you're driving along the road and the traffic light flashes red... You stop. You certainly do. Yes, red is a stop signal. And red rough dishpan hands are a stop signal, too. A signal to stop using soap that leaves hands this way. A signal to change to dental new quick luck. Yes, in actual tests, five well-known dishwashing soaps made hands rough and red. Simply changing to Lux got rid of that unattractive dishpan redness. In from two to seven days, hands began to grow lovelier after stopping those other soaps and starting Lux. It's such an inexpensive way to take care of your hands. Yes, it costs less than one cent a day to change to Lux Flakes for dishes. That generous big box does dishes for about 45 meals. New Quick Lux is fast, thrifty, and so much kinder to hands. Use it for your dishes every day. Stop that unattractive red rough look. Start getting back soft, smooth hands you'll be proud of. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Having solved the problem of the lady doctor and the gentleman playwright, Myrna Loy and Charles Boyer return to the center of our stage. And congratulations are certainly in order. Thank you, C.B. And I know Myrna joins me in thanking the rest of the cast for their fine work. Yes, indeed. And tonight, Charles, we're anxious to congratulate you on something far different from acting. Some of our audience may have missed the item in the papers, Myrna. Suppose you tell them what it is. The fact that Charles is one of Hollywood's newest Americans. With about 450 others, he took the oath of allegiance and became a citizen of the United States a few days ago. Welcome to the family, Charles. Thank you, Sabine. <laughs> of course, I have learned for many years to love this country as my own. In fact, I am very thankful for having been in a position to make my decision a long time ago, back in 1936. It was a free decision made at a time when America had not yet become the last refuge for people from conquered lands. It has always been a great privilege for anyone to become a citizen of the United States of America. But today, when the last hopes of the earth, including those of the people of my native land, rest upon the ability of the United Nations to conquer and to destroy the forces of oppression and aggression, I can truly say, C.B., that there can be no greater thrill or honor. That gives any American new faith and courage, Charles. What's the play next week, Mr. DeMille? The truth is, Manor, it's the great lie. The play is adapted from the Warner Brothers motion picture, and our stars will be Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor. It's the drama of a woman who lives a magnificent lie and her clash with another woman who threatens to expose the truth to the man they both love. An exciting triangle with a trio of stars. Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor. Well, a fine place. You'd be in an excellent cast. Good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night. Good night. Let's make another appointment soon. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor in The Great Lie. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, make America invincible in the air. Buy defense bonds. The money you put into defense bonds provides your pilots with the fastest pursuit ships ever built, the finest, most powerful bombers ever to take the air. Your dollars do count. Buy defense bonds at your bank, post office, or saving and loan association. Myrna Loy appeared through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor. Charles Boyer will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, Tales of Manhattan. Mr. Boyer is under contract to Universal Pictures. Heard in tonight's play were Edgar Barrier as Michael, Arthur Q. Bryan as Hastings, Tony Carlton as Nancy, Charles Seal as Timothy, Mary Virginia Palmer as Edith, Werner Felton as Martha, Thomas Mills as Leary, Griff Barnett as Dr. Gunther, and Dwayne Thompson as Nora.
Tune in next Monday night to hear Loretta Young, George Brent, and Mary Astor in The Great Lie. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.